folks. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, you know, in this Pecha Kuchis format, I'm tempted to like talk really fast, which is uh, what I do anyway. <laughs> it's probably not what I'm going to do tonight. I'll just talk normal and let my slides talk fast. So, what I really want to talk about tonight are the different ways that uh, things that are considered scientific, um, in, in this particular case, uh, audio and visual elements of in, in, uh, birds, in my specific examples, um, are not really that scientific at all, despite the sort of veneer of scientificness that covers them. So I just finished a book in June that came out called The Long Island Island, uh, Birds, Extinction, and Evolution in Hawaii. And I'm from Hawaii. Um, and the spine of the book really is about uh, what it means to say something as a native and to say something belongs. And I have a new idea about nativeness that is somewhat polemical. And if you want to talk to me about that afterwards, I'd be delighted to. That's not the particular thrust of this talk, but in, in, in great brief form, the four birds in the book are the um, stumbling moanalo, kaiokin pao, the uh, kawai o'o, moho percatus, the palila, loxeres dalioi, and then the Japanese white eye, which is the most abundant bird in Hawaii by far. So extinct bird not only from the fossil record, bird that went extinct in 1987, bird that's critically endangered, and it's hyperabundant bird. And my daughter's middle name is palila, so it sort of runs in the, in the family. One of the questions that people have about these fossil birds in particular is what they look like. And this image on the right is uh, from the cover of my book. Um, but the other ones are, are, are birds you'd be hard pressed to imagine their particular, if you found their bones, you'd be hard pressed to, to imagine them looking like that. Um, okay. I'm actually gonna go ahead. So uh, often the visual color data for birds is all we have in a few instances. So this is a shot of the Kawai O'o taken in the Alakai Swamp um, a few years before it went extinct. And they're, only, they're things you can only glean from a living bird. So in some of these birds, the color of their tarsi, their legs, change color when they die. And so you have the remaining, what they call the study skin, but the bird specimen, so the bird specimen dead, uh, has a different color than the bird specimen in life. And so you have to go back into the historical record and look at people's explanations and descriptions of these birds in life, if you're really gonna have a meaningful, accurate, scientific rendering of what they looked like uh, back in the day. So one of the questions is what these extinct birds looked and sounded like. So a few Hawaiian birds, so this is a Brazilian cardinal. How many of you are birders? Any birders in the group? Oh, God, enthusiastic, one hand up, yay. <laughs> uh, how many of you have been to Hawaii? Yeah. Most of you, or a half of you maybe, okay. Try a small intersection. Have you been to Hawaii? <laughs> a bird guy? Um, red vented vulval. I'm just gonna show you some colorful birds and then talk about things <laughs> related to color. The Eevee, uh, Cochinia Vistaria, I took this photo in, the, in, the, in Haleakala. The Palila, Loxiridis Bellui, 1973. Taken by one of the great experts on the Palila, who took the shot uh, the very first time he saw it. Saffron Finch, the, sorry, I'm gonna go back, it's a little too fast. The Saffron Finch, uh, the Red-billed Leothrix, and then the common mina bird, um, a Critotheris tristis tristis. Um, and then another one. So one of the things that people did, sorry, I've got to, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use 10% of my time and tell you how much time I have left. Um, one of the things that I became very interested in the book before this one by a guy, uh, by a guy named Robert Ridgway was the topic of color dictionaries and the ways they were used to quantify colors. It's a very slippery notion if you have to come up with a name for something. Um, so if you're a naturalist and you're working in Kansas, for instance, and you have a flower and it's a particular species and a particular color, and you want to write to someone in Belgium and say, well, I've got this flower, instead of saying, well, it's like a really, really light blue, you can say, well, turn to one of these color swatches, uh, look at the color, and it's that color. And I'm gonna move ahead to some other more precise renderings of this. So these started to show up in the 19th century with some rigor. Um, this is one that, uh, very famous and very rare, Werner's nomenclature, color, nomenclature of colors. And you can see he's uh, taken, uh, it, you'll see it clear in the next slide, animal, vegetable, and mineral to account for the colors. And so here he's got the uh, breast of the cocked bullfinch for the animal, that for tile red, he's got the shrubby pimpernel for the vegetable, and he's got the porcelain jasper for a mineral, and they've all got a number. Um, and so if you're uh, trying to pin down a particular color, you can turn to a swatch like this with some accuracy. The problem is these are all hand painted, and there's a great deal of variation in the hand painting. Uh, there are many other instances of this particular uh, dictionary. Here's another close up here. And there's many of her bird names. So the neck of the mallard, um, the underside or lower wing of the orange tip butterfly. So finally, Robert Ridgway, my guy, comes along 
um, and writes two color dictionaries that are very different than anything that has preceded them. So can you all hear me okay in the back? I'm being mic free here. Um, his 1886 nomenclature of colors for naturalists, um, which he really aims for brood people. There are 433 color swatches. He talks about primary mixing. But then one of the things he does, and this is very interesting to me as a scientist, he starts trying to figure out meaningful names for these uh, colors. So he's got um, dragon's blood red, a real, um, a real confounding color because he talks in the front of this book about how these mythical names are useless. Um, <laughs> if you liked bird feathers, you could dye your own. This is from an ostrich dyer's manual to Huntington. The French have a code de couleur, a repertoire de couleur that they uh, issued. Um, and uh, you can see it says repertoire of colors for aiding in the determination of the color of flowers, leaves, and fruit published by the French Society of Chrysanthemists. And they all do the same thing. They have a foreign um, language, uh, different languages rendering the color. So there's Havana Brown, the ordinary color of uh, cigars of choice, choice cigars. Orange is the color of the lecors, of the, of the husk or the skin of the orange at a perfect maturity. Um, they're, again, they're trying to attend to precision with these color dictionaries. Vin de Bordeaux, um, color of Bordeaux wine. Um, and the greatest thing about this uh, dictionary, there's a there's a one of the color swatches for blue says it's the color of springtime in Paris, <laughs> the color of the sky in springtime in Paris. So Ridgeway comes along in 1912 and with a new printing process, comes up with his own um, 1,115 named colors. And so you can see how much more consistent the colors are. They're printed in uniform tones. Um, they're regular and they're wildly popular and they are the start to what really are the modern Pantone uh, color system. Many of the names get migrated forward and, and even though the Pantone people use numbers, uh, in many cases they also use names still. I wrote a piece for the Smithsonian about these color dictionaries and about Pantone colors a couple years ago. But there's a birdie tie-in with these and a scientific one. So Ridgway, who published a number of things on birds, um, and you'll get a sense for the I don't want to say tedious. You get a sense for the scientific rigor of his language here. So look at this. This is all uh, one sentence, I think. Uh, so, so he's trying to be trying to attend to it with some some you know nearly military precision. But then you see there, if you go down, so he he's got a color called Venetius drab, and he's got a color swatch for Venetius drab. Um, he's got one for sorghum brown, and there is nearly oops, sorry, there is nearly sorghum brown. Uh, and so on. And so to be able to, to, and there's a scientific benefit to having a consistent set of names for these because if you're talking about very small variations, what scientists call subspecific variations, then the, the, the particulars of the colors and their specific tone and shade are, are very meaningful. And so I'm just going to show you some more Ridgeway colors. Um, one of the things I found after the book was out with this little drawing that Ridgeway did when he was 12. And it was found in the archives at the, Nash, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. But there are a number of names I just want to run through this. Um, not one person in a million would be able to tell you who Ampero Blue was, but it's a Pantone color. It's wildly popular. Um, I proposed it for a new common name for a new bird species, and it's probably going to get chosen, I'm delighted to say. Um, Ampero Zeladon was the wife of Ridgeway's best friend in Costa Rica. So uh, he was, he, uh, Jose Zeladon was the head of the Natural History Museum there. Ridgeway and his wife spent months down there with them and they all became friends. And so Amparo is, his, her, is her name. Dragged out of, uh, I've dragged her name out of obscurity. Amparo Blue, you get 88,000 hits for that phrase. Um, there's um, Amparo Blue, there's Chapman's Blue, there's Leitch's Blue, there's Vanderpool's Blue. Uh, Emily Vanderpool was a a, a, book who wrote, a woman who wrote a book called Color Problems. There's Alice Blue. There's uh, King's Blue, Clarence King, who was an um, engineer and geologist. There's Mott Mott Blue. Um, sorry, there's, Jay's, there's Jay Blue, Mott Mott Blue, Roots Blue, uh, Bradley's Blue, and then Amanda Hawaiian Birds. <laughs> uh, and so one of the things that, um, again, I just want to show you some examples of color plates that show how, how similar these birds are and how important the color distinctions among them become. Uh, here's a good example. The Mohoadai is this group of uh, eight birds. It's called that last one at the bottom is the Hawaiian crow. It's not a mo one of the Mohoadai, if anyone cares that much. <laughs> uh, but you can see these honey creepers um, have a very particular bill shape, and the bill color as well as the plumage color becomes very important. Okay, 
I want to talk about sounds and the, and, the, and the terms that scientists use to describe sounds because short of showing a sine wave that represents a sound, if you're going to describe it textually, you're, you're required to make it mean something to people. And it's in that attempt to find meaning the scientists wander off of scientific discourse into literary discourse. So I photographed these today. So here's the Apapane, um, Hamatone sanguinea, probably the most common endemic bird species in Hawaii. And you can see their voice incredibly varied calls and songs, including squeaks, whistles, rasping notes, clicking sounds and melodic trills. Some songs are pleasant and rather canary-like. Others are harsh uh, and mechanical sounding. Uh, the Oma'o, um, nearly extinct bird, um, a high-pitched trill rather like a police whistle and a, tra a twangy ascending series of buzzy notes. They sort of sound like wine descriptions to me. Uh, <laughs> the song is jerky but pleasing, liquid chirps and short whistles. Um, and then perhaps my favorite is this um, voice and all, uh, 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 some random call sound like a child playing with a rusty harmonica. <laughs> so curious, why not a, say a teenager or an adult? Um, so so they, they bake in these uh, very qualitative notions into these descriptions that I find absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much.